When Milton gives us our first sight of the first humans, he positively rhapsodizes about their beauty, calling them in lines 321 to 24, the loveliest pair that ever since in love's embraces met. Adam, the goodliest man of men since born his sons, the fairest of her daughters, Eve. These two are like supermodels, the apotheosis of male and female beauty. And Milton is curiously preoccupied with their loves embraces. Later, he elaborates on what he calls the rites mysterious of connubial love in lines 742 to 43. Their wedded love is quite different from what he calls casual fruition or mere lust, which are sinful in our fallen world. Like the rose without thorns, Adam and Eve's paradisical sex is pure and sinless. This is Open Book, a podcast about interpreting literature, with Michael Elliott. Welcome to Open Book, Episode 7, How to Read John Milton's Paradise Lost, Book 4. I'm Michael Elliott, Associate Professor of English at the University of Calgary. Today's topic is the third episode on Milton's epic poem, covering Book 4, in which Satan arrives at the Garden of Eden. Milton describes the garden and its human and animal inhabitants and the good angels discover Satan trying to influence Eve, whispering in her ear while she dreams. There are four parts to today's episode. The first on Satan's confessional soliloquy, then on Milton's elaborate description of the garden. Finally, then his description of Adam and Eve and the first prohibition before we get Satan's rehearsal of the fall which is a first and failed attempt, which anticipates the real attempt, which will happen later in Book 9. As in every book of Paradise Lost, we have to remember always to divide our reading into sections. We can see that in the beginning of book four, there's an eight-line sequence that follows the, the lament of Milton for the lack of a warning voice. A warning voice that, if it were to happen, uh, in line five, now while time was, our first parents had been warned the coming of their secret foe and escaped. The word now is actually significant, so keep that in mind. But look at the midline shift to the narration in line eight, happily so escaped, etc. For now, Satan, now first inflamed with rage, came down, the tempter, ere the accuser of mankind, to wreck on innocent frail man his loss of that first battle and his flight to hell. The narration I referred to begins at line 8 and goes all the way to 31, uh, narrating Satan's internal mood before his speech begins on line 32. And I've been emphasizing one of the very tiny little repetitions. Uh, But these are important to notice. Even very tiny repetitions like the word now in line 5, again, in line eight, again in line nine, there's a sense of immediacy of these things happening right now as the poet is narrating them. And notice as well how every single verb tense that Milton uses in this opening sequence is in the present tense. Line 16, now rolling boils in his tumultuous breast, recoils upon himself. Line 23, now conscience wakes despair. Line 27, which Eden, which now in his view. Line 30, which now sat high. But in line 31, the word then switches to the past tense, much revolving thus in size, began. There are exceptions. Line 9, came down the tempter. 
uh, and line 28, Eden, lay, pleasant, etc. But the emphasis on verbs and their tenses is is very acute and strong at this pivotal moment of history. Look at line 25, the memory Satan has of what he was, what is, and what must be worse, of worse deeds, worse sufferings must ensue. Besides the repetition of now, there are also quite large repetitions, and they have parallels with other moments in this poem. There are, in fact, two at line 23. The first is conscience. Now, conscience wakes despair. This is a word that recurs through the poem, but one of the more memorable recent occurrences has been God in Book 3, line 195, referring to my umpire conscience that will be inside of every human, whom if they will hear, God says, light after light will use, they shall attain and to the end persisting safe arrive, which feels significant on many levels, for the first being that that was something God said about humans, not about Satan, which is pretty extraordinary and is quite significant given what Satan is about to say and what, he, what characteristics he's about to reveal. And secondly, that Satan is about to dis- directly address the light of the sun. But the stronger repetition, to my mind, is change of place. We have just seen these lines about how he brings a hell within him line 20 for within him hell he brings and round about him nor from hell one step no more than from himself can fly by change of place satan is going to repeat this aloud momentarily at the uh, bottom of the next page uh, around line 73 which way shall i fly infinite wrath and infinite despair he asks which way i fly is hell myself am hell But the word place is very significant, very reminiscent for me of book one with the very memorable lines in one of Satan's very early character-defining speeches when he refers to himself as one who brings a mind not to be changed by place or time. The mind, he goes on, is its own place and in itself can make a heaven of hell, a hell of heaven. It seems now that Satan is alone that that was a bit more aspirational than real. If Satan is indeed hell himself, as he says in line 75, then it does explain how amid this beauty and glory surrounding him, he can feel only hate. All good to me is lost. Evil be thou my good, as he says in lines 109 to 110. Satan's opening soliloquy. I call it that because in Shakespeare, a character will think aloud and directly address the audience as if it was not there. But here, there is no audience. There is just us, and there is just Satan. And this speech that he begins is the most direct self-expression that we get. We also get his thinking through of an argument. Uh, of a self-characterization. It begins with an address to the sun. He expresses regret for his former ingratitude and shame, and finally resignation to his character. But I will leave you to read Satan's opening soliloquy and move along to Milton's description of Eden. Not in full, but I think doing a close reading of Milton's descriptions of trees and bushes and flowers and fruits will be significant. This is a story, after all, of forbidden fruit. So the plants of the garden paradise are essential. Those plants are also essential to answering the question that we might be wondering about Adam and Eve before the fall, just what is it that they did all day? 
around line uh, 437, Adam refers to, quote, our delightful task to prune these growing plants and tend these flowers, which were it toilsome, yet with thee, Eve, were sweet. And later on, Eve will refer to how they have to, I'm sorry, Adam again will say that we have to take up our gardening labors again. He says in line 625, at our pleasant labor to reform yon flowery arbors, yonder alleys green, our walk at noon with branches overgrown that mock our scant manuring and require more hands than ours to lop their wanton growth, those blossoms also and those dropping gums that lie bestrewn unsightly and unsmooth, ask, ask riddance if we mean to tread with ease. So, here in the first garden, Adam and Eve are the first gardeners. Let's look in some detail at Milton's descriptions of the plants of paradise. Start with Satan's approach, starting at line 131. The first thing that I notice about it is that too often I conflate Eden with paradise. I forget that the garden is in fact enclosed within a smaller portion of the region of Eden. Look at what uh, Milton says in line 131. So on he fares, he, Satan, and to the border comes of Eden, where delicious paradise now nearer crowns with her enclosure green as with a rural mound the champagne head of a steep wilderness, whose hairy sides with thicket overgrown, grotesque and wild, access denied. This uh, wilderness, this, this thicket of undergrowth, is not welcoming, but exists as a barrier. Look ahead to line 174 following. So thick and twined as one continued break, the undergrowth of shrubs and tangling bushes had perplexed all path of man or beast that passed that way. It doesn't perplex Satan, but it is intended to. Continuing on with line 137. And overhead, up grew insuperable height of loftiest shade, cedar and pine and fir and branching palm, a sylvan scene. And as the ranks ascend shade above shade, a woody theatre of stateliest view. Yet, higher than their tops, the verdurous wall of paradise upsprung, which to our general sire gave prospect large into his nether empire neighboring round. Two interesting things to note about this. First is that I always thought that this, this barrier that was covered with trees, or sorry, this wall beyond the trees that was overgrown with plants, I always thought of it as a metaphorical wall like a hedge, but if you read the footnotes in Teskey's edition, it's actually a real wall. The other thing that's curious is that it affords or gives Adam this view into a wider empire. So it gives you a suggestion of what sorts of pastimes Adam did, particularly when he was alone before Eve was created. We hear that story a bit later on, that he did some exploring, that he looked around, um, he looked around the garden. Inside the wall, we get fruit trees, among them the tree of life, which is next to the tree of knowledge. Look at 147. And higher, or sorry, 146. And higher than that wall, a circling row of goodliest trees loaden with fairest fruit blossoms. And fruits at once of golden hue appeared with gay enameled colors mixed, etc. We get some more details following line 216. Out of the fertile ground, he, that is God, caused to, to, to grow all trees of noblest kind for sight, smell, taste, and all amid them stood the tree of life, high eminent, blooming ambrosial fruit of vegetable gold. And next to life, our death, the, tr the tree of knowledge, grew fast by, knowledge of good bought dear by knowing ill. Again, as we've seen, no suspense for Milton, but Satan doesn't know this yet. He doesn't know about the tree of knowledge until he overhears it from Adam and Eve, and that allows him to devise his plan for their undoing. 
But before we meet Adam and Eve, Milton gives us one final description of the Garden of Eden. Line 246, Thus was this place a happy rural seat of various view, groves whose rich trees wept odorous gums and balm, others whose fruit, burnished with golden rind, hung amiable. Hesperian fables true, if true here only, and of delicious taste. Betwixt them, lawns or level downs, and flocks grazing the tender herb were interposed, or palmy hillock, or the flowery lap of some irriguous valley spread her store, flowers of all hue, and without thorn, the rose. A wonderful detail that, before the fall, roses had no thorns. Notice, too, the repetition in those lines of the, the word or, lawns or level dawns, or palmy hillock, or the flowery lap of valleys, etc. There's a sense there that in every direction, there's this superfluity, there's this abundance, there's this variety of landscapes. And Milton can hardly do justice to them. They are spilling out of his, of his lines. They are the various view in every direction. When Milton gives us our first sight of the first humans, he positively rhapsodizes about their beauty, calling them in lines 321 to 24, the loveliest pair that ever since in love's embraces met. Adam, the goodliest man of men since born his sons, the fairest of her daughters, Eve. These two are like supermodels, the apotheosis of male and female beauty. And Milton is curiously preoccupied with their loves embraces. Later he elaborates on what he calls the rites mysterious of connubial love in lines 742 to 43. Their wedded love is quite different from what he calls casual fruition or mere lust, which are sinful in our fallen world. Like the rose without thorns, Adam and Eve's paradisical sex is pure and sinless. In Milton's first description of Adam and Eve, look at how he praises them both but moves very quickly to assert eve's subjection signified by of all things the way that she wears her hair he also describes how they are unashamed of their nakedness unashamed and virtuous like the innocent animals that play around them harmoniously as we see in line 340 following but let's look now to lines 288 to 320. Milton has just described various creatures when he turns to, quote, two of far nobler shape, erect and tall, godlike, erect, with native honor clad in naked majesty, seemed lords of all, and were they seemed, for in their looks divine, the image of their glorious maker shone, Truth, wisdom, sanctitude severe and pure, severe but in true filial freedom placed, whence true authority in men. Though both not equal as their sex not equal seemed, for contemplation he and valour formed, for softness she, and sweet attractive grace, he for God only, she for God in him. His fair large front and eye sublime declared absolute rule, and hyacinthine locks round from his parted forelock manly hung, clustering, but not beneath his shoulders broad. She, as a veil down to the slender waist her unadorned golden tresses wore, dishevelled but in wanton ringlets waved as the vine curls her tendrils, which implied subjection, but required with gentle sway, and by her yielded, by him best received, yielded with coy submission, modest pride, and sweet, reluctant, amorous delay. Nor those mysterious parts were then concealed, 
then was not guilty shame, dishonest shame of nature's works, honor, dishonorable, sin bred? How have ye troubled all mankind with shows instead, mere shows of seeming pure, and banished from man's life his happiest life, simplicity, and spotless innocence? So pass they naked on, nor shun the sight of God or angel, for they thought no ill. This business of the hair needs a bit of further examination. The first thing to say is that if you look at a portrait of John Milton, his wavy hair does not tend to go beyond the shoulders. And this is simply a style of men's hair in the mid-late 17th century. It is just uh, part of the rules, part of the convention that it should not go beyond the shoulder. And Eve's, on the contrary, is quite long with these wanton ringlets and so on. Wanton, by the way, not with the negative connotation of sexual promiscuity, but more meaning something akin to luxuriant or profuse of growth or robust uh, in, 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 its, in its profusions. Uh, this is also why the description of the, the, the um, simile of it as a vine implies subjection only because vines grow around other plants or other structures. Later on, we will see the um, comparison to Adam as an oak and Eve as a vine that grows around him. We're already seeing Milton set up their differences, again, right from the very first description of them and with this emphasis on their physicality. And the way that Eve requires a certain amount of correcting or guiding, she looks to Adam for those things. And Adam is very eager to fill that role. The very first speech that he gives uh, betrays the prohibition that God has given to them. Line 419, Adam refers to he, God, who requires from us no other service than to keep this one, this easy charge of all the trees in paradise that bear delicious fruit so various, not to taste that only tree of knowledge planted by the tree of life. So near grows death to life, whatever death is, some dreadful thing, no doubt, for well thou knowest God hath pronounced it death to taste that tree. This, of course, isn't just Adam being Adam. This is Adam providing an important detail that Satan is overhearing at this very moment. Eve's reply to Adam in her first speech is to recall her very first memory, which is quite recent, of her creation, when she awoke and she saw herself in the reflective pool uh, and, and admired her own beauty. Exactly, by the way, as an exact analogy for the Greek myth of Narcissus, who fell in love with his own reflection. Look at Eve's description of her first memory, her self-love, which turns into a fear when she encounters Adam, an apprehension of him, but she ultimately relents. Line 460. As I bent down to look, just opposite, a shape within the watery gleam appeared, bending to look on me. I started back. It started back. But pleased, I soon returned. Pleased, it returned, as soon with answering looks of sympathy and love. There I had fixed mine eyes till now, and pined with vain desire. Had not a voice thus warned me, What thou seest, what there thou seest, fair creature, is thyself. With thee it came and goes, but follow me and I will bring thee where no shadow stays thy coming and thy soft embraces. He whose image thou art, him thou shalt enjoy inseparably thine. To him shalt bear multitudes like thyself, and thence be called mother of human race. What could I do but follow straight, invisibly thus led, till I espied thee, fair indeed, and tall, under a platen, yet methought less fair, less winning soft, less amiably mild than that smooth, watery image. 
back I turned. She is immediately apprehensive, but then ultimately she recognizes what she calls his manly grace and wisdom as superior. Look at lines 489 following. With that, thy gentle hand seized mine. I yielded, and from that time see how beauty is excelled by manly grace and wisdom, which alone is truly fair. If ever there were lines written by a man to be put into the mouth of a woman, they were these. Or perhaps they were these, line 635, following. Eve says to Adam, My author and disposer, what thou bidst unargued I obey, so God ordains. God is thy law, thou mine. She's subjecting herself categorically. And this explains the line 299, He for God only, she for God in him. Milton is deliberately reinforcing the old hierarchy of family life, of the husband in sovereign, the position of, a, of sovereignty, of power, and the wife subjected to him and looking to him for guidance. If you're chafing at this, you're not alone. And Eve is going to join you when she gives her rationale for disobeying the strictures in Book Nine. This is all Satan needs in order to plan his rhetorical assault on their curiosity in lines 512 following. Let me not forget what I have gained from their own mouths. All is not theirs, it seems. One fatal tree there stands of knowledge called, forbidden them to taste. Knowledge forbidden? Suspicious. Reasonless. Why should their lord envy them that? Can it be sin to know? Can it be death? And do they only stand by ignorance? Is that their happy state, the proof of their obedience and their faith? Oh, fair foundation laid whereon to build their ruin. Hence I will excite their minds with more desire to know, and to reject envious commands invented with design to keep them low, whom knowledge might exalt equal with gods. Aspiring to be such, they taste and die. What likelier can ensue? And so Satan immediately puts this plan into action that very night. Meanwhile, the archangel Gabriel, who's warned by Uriel, sends his watchmen, Ithuriel and Zephon, in line 788, to search for Satan. And they find him. Look at line 799. Him there they found squat like a toad, close at the ear of Eve, assaying by his devilish art to reach the organs of her fancy and with them forge illusions as he list, phantasms and dreams, or if inspiring venom he might taint the animal spirits that from pure blood arise like gentle breaths from rivers pure, thence raise at least distemper, discontented thoughts, vain hopes, vain aims, inordinate desires blown up with high conceits engendering pride. Pride is the start of every kind of sin, according to St. Augustine, and it's certainly the start of the original sin, the start of the sin that will lead to breaking the commandment of God. But I'm getting ahead of myself. Book four ends with Satan's confrontation with Gabriel, when in line 990 to 91, quote, dreadful deeds might have ensued, but God then uses his golden scales to adjudicate, and Satan sees that fighting would be pointless, and he flees. But book four is only a trial run. It's like a dress rehearsal for the true fall to come, when Satan will use the exact tactics on the same person, Eve, and prevail before he is sent away. Paradise 
Paradise Lost Book 4 contains so much of the epic story in miniature. It reveals the true Satan at the beginning, it introduces the major players, and it plants the seed of the fall. It even rehearses the fall once in a kind of false start in a dress rehearsal, as I called it. Next time, we'll be for real. You've been listening to Open Book, a podcast about interpreting literature with Michael Elliott. The next episode will be the first of two on Miguel de Cervantes' Don Quixote, in which a bored, mild-mannered 17th century Spaniard decides to add intrigue to his life by becoming a knight from a medieval romance. Meanwhile, you can search me up in the usual places. It should turn up my blog if you spell my surname U-L-L-Y-O-T, or go straight there by typing j.mp slash Elliot. You can also find me on Instagram, YouTube, and Twitter in descending order of regularity. And then there's old-fashioned email, Elliot at ucalgary.ca. That's U-C-A-L-G-A-R-Y dot C-A. The music from this episode is courtesy of the Open Well-Tempered Clavier Project and performed by Kimiko Ishizaka. Mm-hmm.